So welcome everyone to the Hingham Heritage Museum. My name is Deirdre Anderson, and I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Hingham Historical Society. We are so grateful to so many familiar faces who've been subscribers to this year's Waves of, La Waves of Change lecture series, uh, put together so ably by our education committee, represented here today by Eileen McIntyre, greeting people at the door, Elizabeth Danis, who will be up shortly, and Andy Hertig. So we're very grateful for our education committee who put this program together. Before I turn it over uh, to our education committee, I just want to update you on a couple happenings of the Hingham Historical Society. Uh, for those of you who subscribe to the Hingham Journal or are online, you s would see this week that we received um, some very positive news from the Town of Hingham's Community Preservation Committee. They are recommending to town meeting Monday, April 27th, 7 p.m., Hingham High School. Uh, they are recommending to town meeting that the town get grant $772,000 of the Community Preservation Trust Fund to the purchase of the Benjamin Lincoln House at 181 North Street. Thank you. Um, we will be working very, very hard over the next several years to uh, triple and quadruple that amount to be sure that the ownership of that national historic landmark, as well as this spectacular building and Old Ordinary, um, is, can weather any financial storm. So we thank you in advance for your support of that project, and please see me or any of our board members if you have any questions. On February 8th, Saturday, we invite all of you to join us for Hingham High School's National History Day competition. Many of you in this room have served as judges. Hingham High School juniors that have made it past their teacher's vote will come and show their work here as a second step before they go to regional, state, and hopefully for some, national competition. It's a wonderful way to have hope for the future. And again, that's National History Day. will be held here on Saturday, February 8th from 11 to 3 p.m. And then the following Saturday, February 15th, please join us at Old Ship Meeting House for our annual Lincoln Day commemoration. And if you wanted to know all things Lincoln, Paula Bagger, our president of our board, is going to be giving the keynote address about Benjamin Lincoln and his family at 181 North Street. So it's a wonderful primer, as well as, of course, our commemoration and wreath laying at Benjamin Lincoln's grave and at the Lincoln statue in Fountain Square. So that's it for our upcoming events. I am grateful for your presence. Here is Eileen McIntyre, uh, Elizabeth Andy Hertig, <laughs> to introduce today's speaker. Andy, thanks. For a lecture series entitled Ways of Change, what could be a more appropriate topic than transportation, since we seem to be on the verge now of redefining our traditional relationship with fossil fuels and the automobile? Massive traffic jams, um, self-driving cars, the possible demise of the internal combustion engine, all of this suggests major changes are ahead. And what better person to depict these changes as how they affected Hingham than Bob Malmey, our speaker, uh, this afternoon. Bob grew up in Hingham, and having earned his, uh, his bachelor's degree at Tufts in political science, he's intimately familiar with the Boston area. But he has expanded his point of view with a degree in public policy from Duke University, where he stayed on for 18 years as a researcher, uh, focusing uh, in part on the construction of, of local transportation systems. He returned to Massachusetts in 2010 to earn a degree in library science and archival management at Simmons, and since 2013 he has worked as an archivist here at the Historical Society, helping to manage our collections and bring to, to light some of the treasures in the collection. And we are privileged this afternoon to experience some of the fruits of his labors uh, in a 
fascinating presentation of slides and excerpts from local newspapers which trace the evolution of transportation in Hingham from the horse and buggy to the steamboat to the railroad to the electric trolley and finally the automobile. Bob tells me that his presentation will be about an hour followed by questions and then we will adjourn downstairs for um, refreshments. And may I also remind you please to turn off your cell phones before we begin. So with no more uh, information, please join me in welcoming Bob Mountain. Good afternoon, anybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for all for coming. Thanks, Andy, for that gracious introduction. Uh, thanks to Eileen and uh, I speak to now. Okay, I can speak now a bit better. Okay, thank you. I uh, also thank, thank Eileen McIntyre for helping some, with some of my research on this project. Um, I have been just, I've been glad that a lot of you could come out in the severe, uh, the severe New England winter day. <laughs> And uh, I know some of you have probably given up your, your traditional uh, family uh, gathering for the Pro Bowl today, so I'm glad you could make it. Um, well, yes, okay. Um, uh, I'll mic up a little bit more here. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Um, as uh, Andy suggested, I'll be looking at 100 years of uh, transportation history. Um, starting with about 1850 and moving on. And given this uh, the, the long period of time we're talking about, about an hour to talk to you about it, uh, I decided to uh, split the, uh, okay, um, split it into four 25 year periods. Um, we'll start out with the 1850 to 1875 period, talk about the limited options that were available in Ingham at that time. At that time, uh, we'll move on to the late 19th century to talk about the new improved modes appeared with the Industrial uh, Revolution era, and then we'll rise, talk about the 20th century, the arrival of the uh, horseless carriage and its effect on other modes of transportation. And finally, uh, 1926, 1950, we'll talk about the available trains, and we'll talk about planes and a lot of automobiles. Okay, so we'll start out in 1850, or in this case, 18, actually, this is a map um, put together in 1830, um, just showing the town at that time, put together by um, Reuben Hersey and Jedediah Lincoln. Uh, shows the town structure at the time. Hingham was largely you know, rural town, about, about 4,000 population at that time. Um, a mixture of agriculture and light industries, uh, particularly um, involving uh, the um, wooden buckets, et cetera, which you may already know about. And as you can see from this, um, oh, okay, anyway, so um, some of the streets that didn't exist at that time, you, know, you see from the map, include like Central Street, uh, Cushing, uh, Downer Avenue, much of the streets around in uh, Fricot Point, uh, Lincoln Street to Weymouth, and um, Oda Street and, and Winter Street near Falls and in the surrounding areas. Um, and um, here we have initial two, if you, from the beginning of the town to this point, basically two options you really had to get around town were by horse or by foot. So we'll talk about horse transportation first. Uh, first, I should tell you that many of the photos we have in this section are from actually later periods in time. There weren't a lot of, it was photo, photography was in its infancy, and so there wasn't a lot, a lot of photos from that period of time in our collection, but I'll try to do illustrative for, um, of the various things with uh, the newer, these other photos. So here we have uh, what is probably a fashionable Hingham gentleman traveling, um, what a fashionable Hingham gentleman traveled through town in about 1890 on uh, Hingham streets. And if you did travel by horse, you of course had a choice of doing it on either on a horseback uh, by yourself, or as this uh, older gentleman doing probably one of the hills of Hingham unidentified around 1890, or you could do it uh, behind a carriage in a carriage behind a horse or two. Uh, these are two uh, two men at the harbor somewhere um, behind a horse and a carriage. And you, or if you didn't have a carriage, you'd always have hire one with the local livery stables that might be available. Or you could take a ride in one of the various stages that ran, the stage for instance here, ran typically from the steamboat docks to Hingham Center in, in South Hingham. Um, and of course Hingham, the, the carriage and the horse transportation area was more than just a horse and buggy show. Um, it had other trades that were involved. Um, 
the 1860 census uh, tended to show a lot of the related businesses. This included um, uh, horse harness makers, uh, carriage makers, uh, a lot of established Hingham names in this, including uh, Humphrey and Witten for carriage makers, uh, Loring for leather tanners, Teamsters or transporters, we'll have a Hersey, a Hobart, and a Witten. Blacksmiths, there were 14, a lot of them needed for horseshoeing. So more than 60 of the 1,159 Hingham households at that time uh, related to horse-related transportation. And some of the, there are lots of businesses. This is uh, down near Hingham Center. This is a combination of livery stable and horseshoery place, a couple of buildings, businesses at that point just near Pear Tree Hill. And several of the businesses, according to the one business here at Hingham Center. Um, and of course, you business uh, driving around with business for pleasure. I think this is being a uh, pleasure ride. A couple of people uh, taking a photo in front of their carriage in front of the old ship church. Um, traveling around there. And if for businesses, you might consider something like these, this hill, a lot of express people, uh, businesses around it allows you to either originally to take freight from Boston to Hingham directly, and later on, they trade basically went to the train stations and delivered packages and homes and to businesses from there. So, of course, what, if you didn't have a horse, for instance, you, you sort of picture the uh, old days, everybody had a horse, but it was not necessarily the case. If you, you know, lived, at, you know, worked downtown, for instance, you didn't have a lot of land, you didn't have a barn, you couldn't have a place to keep a horse, you may not have it. And, of course, there was expense involved in owning a horse. While it may cost, have cost you about 10 to $15, to get one, it would probably be a lot more to you know, provide it with food and whatever else it needed to keep it healthy. So that was, had to work into your budget, all else, as well as you know, you're buying a saddle, 20 to $50, or and a buggy might run a typical one, 20 to 50 or more if you wanted a more fancier one. All this in 1860 when the average wage was about uh, a little less than $6. So if you didn't have a horse, you ended up having to travel by foot. Here we see a gentleman crossing Main Street in, around 1900 in Ingham Center. Um, of course, you didn't always necessarily travel in the streets. You maybe, uh, most of the time, you traveled with a path along the side of the road. Or, or This is the more fancier sidewalk I could find in our collection. This is looking at Elm Street, the corner of Main looking west and by the, uh, the First Baptist Church. And you see there's some of the sidewalk along the right there. But it's basically just separated from the road by hitching posts uh, for riders to the Sunday services to tie up their horse at the time. Uh, more often, you would just see a path along the side of the streets. Here you see some well-dressed, um, maybe Sunday-dressed women uh, walking through um, about 1880, one of the one on unidentified street in town. And you might, and since you might be traveling in the path, it may not necessarily be during good weather and during rain, or it might have filled up with uh, water, and you might be walking in the street. And if you did so, um, streets sort of looked like um, this would be a sort of a common what a common street would look like. This is taken at uh, Main Street, looking at Glad Tidings Plain uh, around uh, 1890. A lot of ruddy roads, and this is on a perfectly nice day. Imagine if it had been raining or snowing or whatever. And so if you did have to walk, if you did have work to do, uh, there's chronicles of residents of uh, Tuttleville at the corner of High Street and uh, Ward Street who had to you know, walk miles to work every day there in Weymouth or in Hingham Square. And so you had to do it in all sorts of weather, so it wasn't always easy. It could be, it could be raining a lot or it could be, um, it could be a lot of snow on the streets here. <laughs> this is taken downtown uh, around 1900. And you see that well, not really plowed the street, so it looks like they plowed the sidewalk across the line around the Lincoln Building. Okay, so and you always had to be traveling. You had to be careful of other carriages and stuff <laughs> in the street. Uh, what might have been, you know, what might have been in the street before you, whether it was a horse or, in this case, we have elephants traveling down Levitt Street. Um, they're going to the uh, agricultural fairgrounds um, around 1890, and so you might have to be careful to watch what you step in. <laughs> so, um, so if you're traveling out of town, basically historically the two options you had was by you know, take horse or by boat. Early on in Hingham history, by boat was a better choice because the roads were so bad. But around 1800, the, uh, the, there were several turnpikes built in town and the road improvements, so it made it easier to get into Boston, for instance, by uh, horse and carriage. 
uh, and boats before 1819, you had a packet boat or a steel, or, you know, sailing boat that you could book packet passage on that you made daily and weekly trips into Boston for supplies. But, and, but they were, of course, largely relied on the good, good weather to run. That sort of changed in 1819 with the development of the steamboat. And here you see probably 1880 passengers on one of the steamboats heading in or back to Hingham. Um, the steamboat line formed in 18, 1819, the Hingham and Boston Steamboat Company um, was the first, actually, the first uh, known in the country. It uh, ran a boat called the Eagle. If you go downstairs on the second floor, there's sort of an illustration of the first steamboat down there. Uh, the Eagle lasted a couple of years, and then between about 1819 and 1830, the service was rather irregular. Several different boats were taken, were showed up uh, to transport people. Probably a lot of the regular duty was it was a new new industry, new invention, and of course things break down a lot early on, so you couldn't always depend on the steam line. But by 1831, the steam uh, ship company was officially incorporated, and it started the running um, a ship called the uh, Benjamin Lincoln, um, and uh, that sort of ran every uh, hour and a half. It ran one boat, one in and out per day. It took one and a half hours to go in 35, seven and a half cents each direction. Uh, 35 cents for both directions. And the, uh, here's an illustration of the General Lincoln. And you, you don't have any photos going back in it early, but it shows you what the boat looked like. And other later boats um, turned, uh, by 1850, the, steam, the original steamboat dock was at the end of, surprisingly enough, Steamboat Lane. <laughs> and by, in 1830, but by 1850, it had moved back, as you can see, down further down to where it is Barnes Wharf uh, today. And um, so in 1850, the uh, ship was the Mayflower. And here we see a uh, ad in the Hingham Journal from April 1851, advertising that the steamboat Mayflower under the, cap under the command of Captain Elijah Beale leaves 7.30 in the morning and comes back from Boston at 4.30 in the afternoon for a grand total fare of 15 cents. And they sometimes would stop at Hull on the way to pick up passengers. Now, I don't know necessarily, did people go to the dock and wave at the, at the, sea, at the sea boat came by, and they stopped. Um, and of course, there's a, now a commuter rail, uh, a commuter boat uh, stop at that place, at Pemberton Barge now. Um, you could bring, pat, you could uh, also load uh, freight if you, uh, for a total, of, uh, if you arrived about 15 minutes earlier and arranged for passage of that. Um, there are, of course, ancillary businesses related to the steamer boat, as, as they were with the horse industry. Um, one of those businesses was hotels, resorts. Uh, by the 1850 era, um, many people were having more leisure time and wanted to get out of the cra more crowded and then dirty cities to come out to the uh, clean uh, areas outside of town. And so the steamboats offered the opportunity for people to do that. And so that in order to profit on that possibility, the steamboat company actually in 1832 decided to build its own hotel, which they called the Old Colony House. And it was now uh, on Summer Street at the hill overlooking the harbor. Uh, it's located on what became known as Old Colony Hill, which is, of course, the location where you uh, meet Martin's Lane and Summer Street turns to the right at the top of that hill. Um, but eventually, the steamboat company found it was unprofitable, so in 1837, they sold it off to more other interests to run the hotel. And they did that for good and bad until 1872, when it was eventually abandoned and burned down. And another related industry you might have is you know, people who would you know, transport you to and from the steamboat. Here you see an ad in the March 18, 8, 1850 Hingham Journal. Um, by Edwin Wilder saying that he would happily, uh, if you want, come by his office, which is located at the Union Hotel, which is now the collocation of the post office, at the corner of Fearing Road and North Street, and sign up. Uh, he would gladly pick you up or take you to the boat for 12 and a half cents each way, or you could range through Boston and you would have to pay 25 cents to do that. So in the late 1860s, it actually, the steamboat became more popular, that there was actually competition in town. Um, a man named Harvey T. Litchfield uh, decided to buy the wharf, Cushing's Wharf, next to the Barnes Wharf, and it was renamed Litchfield Wharf, and he decided to run his own steamboat line, which he called the People's Line, and to compete with directly with the Hingham and Boston Steamboat Line. And his uh, boats were, first he had a boat called the Nantasket, and later it was a faster boat than the William Harrison, and the two Hingham steamboats were the John Romer and the Rose Standish. Here you see uh, the John Romer at the dock later on in 1890. 
Um, the fares drastically reduced during this time. It went from 25 cents in around 18, 1867 to about 5 cents in 1870. And uh, to try to corner the market completely for the last month of the season in 1870 to hang in Boston, the company decided to charge nothing for a trip to and from Boston, hoping to corner the market. I don't know if it worked right away, but by 1872, Litchfield gave up and put his efforts into the salary as a steamboat dock in Nantasket. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, have a, a picture of any of his steamboats. So by 1850, actually, the newest uh, option that you would see was the train. And the train came to town via the South Shore Railroad, which was established in 1848 and constructed tracks and opened the, uh, the train service, actually, on January 1st, 1849. First president was Alfred C. Hersey of Hingham. Uh, the train ran from the Braintree where it tied into the existing old colony rail tracks. That train line opened in 18, 1845 from Boston to Plymouth. And it ran um, along the coast to uh, Hink, downtown Cohasset at that time. Here's a picture from about the 1890s showing the uh, a train going over the Water Street and uh, Mill Cove areas of, of the town from the Hingham Cemetery. Um, it, uh, there was four stations in town, um, downtown Hingham Station, there was one in West Hingham, there was one where the tracks crossed Summer Street called the Old Colony House, and there was one located where it crossed Hull Street called the Nantasket at that time. Um, we saw the new train depot downtown, that was showing, the very, that's one of the very earlier pictures of the square, the tower you saw was taken down in, 18, in 1863, so this thought it had to be before that period of time. And the station was between uh, Main Street and what is now Central Street along North Street. And here you see the frontage along North Street at that time, about 1860. And it also, the train tracks ran along the bed of the uh, Old Town Brook, which required it to be put underground and piped in many locations, especially through downtown. So here we see the former Broad Bridge uh, going over the creek, now turned into a railroad track with a sign above it, which you can't really clearly see, but it says railroad crossing look out for an engine if you hear a bell ringing. So <laughs> the train people, the, there were no gates or anything at this time. You just had to be aware of every time you crossed train track that there might be a train coming. And you see the really recently completed Lincoln Building on the right of this photo. It's taken about 1861. And in addition to the train station downtown, there was a freight yard built along South Street. It, it started down where the Sherman Williams uh, store and the parking lot is now. Here you see uh, 1890 photo of some hay being loaded Onto the onto the tracks at the uh, at the at the freight yard. It also changed many streetscapes in town too. Uh, this is a photo around 1890, looking what's called Torrance Crossing. This is along South Street, where a road prior to the old colony returning went between South and North Streets. Uh, South Street itself was very wide, and it's in West Hingham where the train's tracks, so the train tracks split um, South Street into two and left you with two South Streets, one running to the South Square, and one running behind, as you now is behind the laundry and the uh, Pablo's candy and that sort of thing. And it's, they still have the two South Streets. We've been trying for years to, maybe people suggested changing the name of that other South Street so it's confusing, but it hasn't happened as of yet. Uh, to see. <laughs> um, so in 1849, when the trains ran, uh, they started with one trip a day, uh, one passenger car, maybe tied to two or three uh, freight cars. Uh, here's a notice from the uh, March 8th, 1850, a Hingham Journal saying that there now will be two runs a day, a regular run, train run and a new express run that will leave uh, just Coasset and stop in, and leave them from Coasset, stop at Nantasket, and then at Hingham. And, if you use the new express train, you would uh, be able to get to Boston for 15 cents. It took about an hour for you to get into the town. And by 1860s, even though the number of commuters that actually left from Hingham in 1865, they had a census, and the state run the census and figured this out. There are about 45 uh, commuters all told that left from Hingham at that time. But even that, it was increased use by the passenger cars at the, during the era of the two or three passenger trains by uh, 1867, and it grew to about six or eight trips per day by 1875. In 1871, the, uh, sex, the South Shore Railroad was leased to the old Colony Railroad, and they expanded uh, the line to Duxbury. And later, it went to Plymouth for a while, and the train demand became so high that people in South Hingham felt left out. Uh, they thought that they should have a train line on their own, so one was proposed to go through Norwell, parallel Main Street up to where Central Street is now, and then sort of cross over to the existing uh, tracks uh, near uh, on uh, Fort Hill Street. Um, they 
brought res the supporters brought uh, amendments and, and articles to town meetings over several years, in 1869 or 1872, and they never passed town meeting either to uh, in, in improve of a train line or actually in a couple cases uh, buy stock in the, in the train line to help support construction. So in 1876, we're moving to a new era now. We're talking about the largely and now we're more of an industrial era. Um, here we have a photo I like uh, taken about in sort of exemplary of that era. We're looking at a photo taken by Charles Marble um, from the steeple of the Congregational Church on Main Street. He's looking west. He's looking uh, at down Main Street towards the corner of Central Street, which is, uh, looks awfully cold. Um, and um, we uh, and shows the uh, several houses, including the uh, really new, uh, the first Hingham High School building. So and you had a lot of more options, um, more carriage traffic during this period of time. A lot of it was due not necessarily to industries in Hingham, which a lot of the, you know, the industries were sort of dying out at that time, but had to do with increased uh, resort traffic, especially in the summertime, and traveling through town and to other places. Um, Hingham was becoming less and less of a, of a resort town. So here's a map of, from a bird's eye map from 1885, uh, showing the layout of the town at that time. Um, here you see, the, you can point out that there's a very, you can see a steamboat um, landing at the dock. You can see a train traveling across the Mill, Mill Pond area in various uh, streets at that time, including, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so um, you, you did see increased uh, carriage and, and, and horse traffic. Um, here we see uh, someone in a carriage passing the now Cushing House at the corner of uh, Fearing Road and North Street around 1895. Um, you can see in the back there's the uh, Cushing House livery stables, um, the main operation as part of that hotel. You also saw a lot more new delivery uh, services. Um, the Charles T. Levitt had an ice uh, making system. Uh, he he uh, carved ice out of the Cushing Pond during the winter and he sold it during the summer. And you're, here you see him traveling uh, his cart, ice cart along South Street around uh, 1892. And you saw a lot more freight uh, related traffic. Um, his uh, Cobbs Hingham Express travel, you know, did most of his business taking uh, freight and uh, other things from the train stations to people in town. This was taken about 1897. And there's still a lot of strong supporting industries for the horse industry at that time. Uh, the 1885-86 Hingham Business Directory list listed three harness makers, including a Henry Cushing at the harbor and a Hersey at the center. Uh, three hacks or barges or transportation related business, including George Cushing at the Cushing House, uh, several livery stables, uh, including George Bassett at Main and Elm Street, which are right around across the street here. There's also one down at the Cushing House and one at um, Irving and um, Levitt Streets. Here's a picture of that livery stable about uh, 1890 or so. You can sort of see the new fire hydrant that they put in at the time after the water came into the town. Now there's also uh, the horse industry benefited by better technology during this period as well. Here you see an ad in uh, July, uh, Hingham, uh, 1900 Hingham Journal regarding the new rubber carriage tire that was available at the M.K. Hunkley shop. She owned a horse shoery and jobbery uh, shop uh, at the corner of uh, Water Street and um, Summer Street where the fruit center is. Uh, here's a picture of his shop around that time. Uh, as you can see, there's still horses and carriages about there, but you see a, a remnant of a, a new upcoming transportation uh, option that I'll talk about soon. So what about steamships? Well, the steamships um, began to increase their peak travel during this period of time. Um, the, uh, there were the steamer John Andrew, a new steamer, which you see here, leaving the dock around in the early 1890s. And here you see on the bay, uh, traveling to Boston, uh, was joined by a new uh, Benjamin Lincoln, General Lincoln steamer, um, and a couple of outstanding steamers like the Rose Standish and the William Harrison from the People's Line. There were also more options as far as uh, docks concerned to get into a steamboat into Boston. Here we see a, a page from the 1890 Crow Point uh, resident directory uh, telling people about the available steamboat schedule and train schedule. Here's about a 10, uh, a 10 steamboats leaving for Boston, and you have about a dozen trains leaving as well, 
which it shows the upcoming competition between the train and the steamship, which the steamship eventually was losing out to the railroad. These other options, transportation options, and the dock options, and to curtail passengers in the uh, Hingham dock itself. Uh, the trains didn't run, the steam boats didn't run in the winter time, so you saw a boat docked into the uh, steamboat and during the winter time. And um, eventually, in 1881, uh, the steamboat line was sold. Uh, New Interest took it over, and they decided to concentrate more of their efforts on the resorts, Nantasket, and and uh, the new uh, Melville Garden, which opened in 1871 on Crow Point, instead of Hingham. So you had only one boat going to the Hingham docks between 1881 and 1884. Uh, the steamboat line decided to change its name to were incorporated. It was first the uh, Hingham and, and Old Colony steamboat line. And in 1884, they changed it again to the Hingham Hull and Downer Landing Steamboat Company. And about that time, they restored two boats to the Hingham docks but they started, but they reduced the number of runs, and so by 1890 or so, you only had five um, boats stopping at the Hingham docks or leaving the Hingham docks every day, uh, versus 11 to Nantasket and eight from the Outer Landing. And to to, as a result of this, they decided to change their name finally again to the Nantasket Beach Steamboat Company, getting rid of Hingham out of the name entirely. And so the inner steamboat, the steamboat uh, era ended in the Inner Harbor in 1898 after the uh, Portland storm, uh, named after the boat that was uh, sunk during that weather event in November of 1898. And the, here we see a photo taken after the storm showing the wrecked uh, Hingham dock with a couple of steamboats, the Miles Standridge on the left, and a boat called the Hingham on the right, and what remains of the dock. Uh, the, Steamboat company owners surveyed and said it would take over $20,000 to build the dock, and they didn't want to put that investment in due to the number of passengers now leaving for Hingham. So in 1899 in the spring, they uh, made an announcement that they would stop Inner Harbor Steamboat Service, and that the steamboat would stop at Crow Point. Um, the downer landing um, line had ended around 1890, after the season of 1896 when Millville Garden closed down but they asked the town to restore the dock and dock there for there. So by 1900, here's an ad in the Hingham Journal for uh, 1900, which indicates that uh, in July 1900, there were um, only one trip from and two, three trips to uh, the Crow Point dock compared to all the other docks uh, they have in the line for Nantasket. So that leaves us next uh, with what happened to the train. And actually, the train during this time actually get, train actually during this time gained some speed, um, added uh, inventory and tracks and lines to it. Here we see a a train uh, leading from the uh, new Nantasket railroad line, which started from the Nantasket Junction, then the renamed Old Colony Hill, which changed to Nantasket Junction, and the Nantasket Station changed its name to North Cohasset. Um, here we see a train, the train depot around 1888 or 1889, launch line of people waiting for the train, and a carriage uh, waiting for possibly uh, people to get off the train. Uh, 7,200 um, tickets were sold during that month. And uh, this is a comparison showing the amount of daily departures to Boston and Ringham between 1888 and 89, and you see it goes up almost triple between 1886. And on a weekday, one on Sunday to 1900, you have 20 trips per day. Uh, weekdays and six on Sundays. Um, but the, uh, we also had uh, the industrial era, rather new uh, way of transporting around uh, called the bicycle. Uh, here we see a group of young men in front of several model bikes around in 1890s someplace. Um, as you can see, um, there was one newer bike at the bottom, which is uh, the more popular safety bike uh, in 1885. And you see a couple older um, large wheel, Columbia large wheel bikes in the back. A uh, little history on bicycles uh, to say, uh, they were first invented way back in 1817 in Germany, but it wasn't until um, a man named Michel and the philosophy in France in the 1860s got the reputation to be known as the bone shaker, <laughs> which wasn't a very <laughs> complimentary name. Uh, its design was adapted in what was in the American U.S. by the Columbia Bicycle Company, and they created a high-wheel bike in 1878. 
But again, there are a lot of safety problems with that. It got the reputation for being only for what they would say at the time, uh, thrill-seeking young males <laughs> and versus other, other people in the, in the general population. That changed with the safety bike in 1885, which had two uh, smaller wheels and a chain drive to help drive it. Uh, this is the first really popular models of bicycles and tricycles. Here we see a, um, a gentleman um, in the uh, center on his tricycle in 1893. His name is David Cobb, senior, and he's with his dog. Um, and you also saw ads in newspapers like this one from the 1889 uh, Hingham Journal. You could rent actually bicycles or tricycles for the day or the week. 35 cents an hour, five dollars a week, and uh, if you didn't have, so you didn't have to own a bike to be able to use one. And it was a you know, bicycle became it, you know, everybody could use a bike or a tricycle. And here we see a young woman in Hingham Center around 1896 with her bike, and uh, it was very popular. And the popularity of bicycles and the use of bicycles got the first. Uh, need for a good roads movement in America. People assumed that this good roads idea started with cars, but it actually started with bikes in the 1880s when in popularity people wanted to use their bikes and wanted good roads to travel on them. So this, this spread throughout the country at that time. It actually sort of precedes that a little in Hingham. That was a shot of, uh, this is a shot of Main Street with Pear Tree Hill being cut down around 1876. You're looking north. Uh, towards the home meadows, and the hill along the left side will be cut down too. And uh, a lot of effort went into what was called street straightening at that time. Uh, tried to the increase traffic, people complaining of the large carriages and other traffic in the streets. Um, the need for a wider street, so in 1876, most of the towns, um, 29 of the 68 town meeting articles regarded street improvements, widening, um, that sort of thing. And initially, the selectmen were really the road supervisors and responsible for overseeing widening uh, of uh, particular streets and roads and their improvements. But in 1884, uh, basically, the good roads people pushed through a uh, bill in the legislature saying each town, each municipality, should have its own street superintendent to oversee the street improvements. So Hingham hired Alonzo Kimball, and he started right away he, uh, on North Street. He widened that because uh, places between the harbor and West uh, Hingham, the, the street was as narrow as 25 feet wide, which uh, caused a lot of problems and bottlenecks of uh, larger carriages at that time. In addition to street improvements, you did see new streets at this time. Um, Ode Street, which initially was built from Samuel down or down to Broad Cove area, uh, the, with the help of the town, it, they extended that from across Broad Cove to Shift Street in 1877. Central Street, which was really just uh, originally a sort of a path to the ropes works of uh, factories along that area of town, was widened and built through to Elm Street in 1872 and finally to the square in 1895. And Lincoln Street, which uh, stopped around the Crow Point area, the Broad Cove Road area. Uh, in fact, you know, the Central Street area was extended to Weymouth. This allowed another alternative method for people to get to Weymouth and the turnpike that was built, which is now Beale Street through um, that part of Bingham. And of course, more roads led to more sidewalks and helpful for pedestrians, although the, the, the sidewalks weren't necessarily much better. Here we see what appears to be just a flattened uh, dirt path along Main Street, Hingham Center. This uh, shows that it's in front of the first Hingham Public Library, and this building built, burned down in 1879, so this picture was probably taken around 1876 or so. At sort of the end of the 19th century, we saw the biggest uh, improvement of all, the new option for town, the electric streetcar trolley. Here you see a commemorative photo taken of the first uh, Hingham streetcar after it was officially opened in June of 1896. Uh, short history of the electric streetcar. It was first mentioned in 1899. People, uh, the people um, created a uh, Several people created and called an association for Weymouth Hingham on, on Rail Line, and this uh, lobbied uh, people and investors to build a streetcar line in both towns. Uh, the 1890 investors were found and they started construction, but they did only in Weymouth and it ended in 1891. And frustrated Hingham people got tired of waiting, so by 1893, 94, they began lobbying the selectmen to say, "We had our own streetcar line. We should have one ourselves." And finally, the selectmen relented in 1894, and they held a public meeting where most of the people supported the idea. 
exception to being like prominent citizens such as uh, for Governor John D. Long, who will later be the first uh, president of the Hingham Historical Society. He thought there's already much, too much traffic on the streets anyway, pedestrians and bikes and wagons and all this, the train crossings, and uh, adding a streetcar would be a dangerous and, and un, un welcome change, but his, uh, his ideas didn't prevail. So the, 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 ta the town passed along to the legislature a bill asking for a charter, and in 1895, the legislature approved that. And uh, Hingham Street Railway Company was founded, and then they had their first stockholders meeting in January 1896, where they decided to build 18 to 19 miles of tracks, uh, purchase about uh, 18 to 19 um, uh, open or summer cars, and about five to six closed or winter cars. And uh, here you see a couple of the street cars, number 36 and 39, being delivered to the freight yard on South Street. The first tracks were laid out at the corner of Fearing Road, at Fearing Road and North Street in about March of uh, 1896. Uh, cars started arriving in April and May. Here we see the arrival of a Nantasket Beach car from uh, and getting loaded onto the South, from the South Street freight yards in uh, May of 1896. And here you see a photo from the John P. Richard Collection, collection uh, owned by the Hingham Historical Commission and Society of uh, Phil, one of the early streetcars with people on it traveling along Summer Street. Uh, the company decided to uh, build a powerhouse and uh, car barn on, on the harbor front in the former uh, Eagle Iron Foundry location. And you see uh, passing nearby that, that building. And uh, they hired over 100 people, mostly from the Hingham Pipeball, to man the streetcars and, and other operations for the company. Here you see uh, some of the streetcar employees in front of the car, in front of the car barn on Summer Street around 1900. And the streetcar line had very early success. Um, it ran, basically you ran four different places. You could run to Nantasket along North Summer and Rockland Streets. You could run Queen Anne's Corner along Main Street. You could run it up Lincoln Street and you could go through to Weymouth and then connect to Quincy along Lincoln Street or you could take a connection to Downers Landing um, at Downer Avenue. Uh, the fare, initial fare was five cents, including transfers. Uh, school children were charged a half rate for that. And the initial cars were run to Queen Anne's Corner every 30 minutes, and then they had task it every 15 minutes. And according to a history book, uh, the last half of the 1896 order, 450,000 people uh, used the streetcar line at that time. Here you see a streetcar descending Paratree Hill from Queen Anne's Corner around 1898. And here you see an Antasket Beach car at Liberty Pole Hill about 18, in the 1896 era. So this brings us to the 20th century and arrival of the horseless carriage. Uh, uh, illustrative of this is uh, a uh, postmaster, Irvin Horton, here sitting in his Stanley steamer in front of the former post office location on South Street. And he's uh, waiting for mail, a download of mail for delivery. Um, here's a map of what Hingham looked like in 1903, showing the basic routes and the centers of population. It somewhat spread out from the downtown area along Main Street towards Queen Anne's Corner, and then West Hingham area and towards down around Crow Point. Uh, some quick automobile history. Um, uh, the first, of course, the uh, car was just in the pier in 1900. It was uh, largely invented and through the invention first of the combustible. Uh, internal combustion engine in the 1880s, and then various uh, manufacturers in the 1880s and 1890s. The first American factory is credited to the Dury Motor Company, Wagon Company in uh, Michigan in about 19, you know, 1893. Uh, the first cars we models we would probably recognize came along in the early 1900s, uh, including uh, some GM cars in the early 1901-92. And the original Martin Model A Ford, not the later one that came after the Model D, but the original one was built in 1903. Uh, the first Model T, the first popular car, was in 1908, although mass production didn't start until 1913. Uh, the first popular type you see is actually a wheel motor buggy, which is as, actually, as it describes, is basically a motor buggy, but you put it in, uh, put in the front, an engine in the front and steering wheels and various things and to operate it. Uh, Reported the first Hingham automobile owned by the Hinghamite was by Francis Brewer, uh, father of Wilman Brewer, the poet, who later contributed the uh, Old Ordinary to uh, the historical side in the name of his father in the 1920, 1920 or so. Um, and he didn't, didn't like the invention all that much. He ended up assisting on parking at about 200 feet from his house, thinking it might blow up. So he, <laughs> after having it a month or two, he sold it. 
And so, but that, despite that, Hingham still saw more the increasing amount of automobiles. And by 1910, they actually had the Hingham Auto Club was formed. Here we see one of the earlier ads for an automobile in the Hingham Journal. Uh, this is from 1905. Uh, the first one I saw where somebody in Hingham was selling cars. This guy, Mr. Uh, Brigham on Ship Street, was selling uh, four models of uh, Cadillacs. Uh, you could have any color as long as it was um, booster green. And uh, three, and the models ranged from uh, 750 to 2800 at the time, so they weren't essentially cheap. Um, and here we see what I call an early auto show. Uh, this is from the Richardson collection, it was scanned by Stephen Dempsey, thank you. Uh, showing four early Ford models parked along South Street in 1909. With the, I initially thought this was probably a gathering of the auto club, as I said, well, maybe it was a, a preliminary uh, meeting of the auto club. Anyway, so the show that cars were making their appearance in Hingham. But not, they didn't have much of an effect until a little after 1910, uh, largely because cars were so relatively expensive. Uh, I saw an ad in the 1905 Hingham Journal with the models priced between $900 and $250. Uh, I did a little back in the envelope calculation, um, and it's probably the price between $23 and $50,000 in all um, for the cost of the automobile at that time for today's dollars. So the town relied largely on horses for fire department and public works projects. Uh, into the 1910s. Here is, is a, a fire brigade uh, in front of their engine in front of the, one of the Hingham Fire Department uh, buildings uh, using a horse for transportation. This could have been any time between 1900 and 1920 when the department became fully recognized. Uh, here you see a town meeting order from 1915 asking the, the people to approve a, a, a resolution to approve the uh, rate of their paying for rental horses for various public work projects to 25 cents a day. So they were still relying largely on horses to get things done in the mid-teens. And, uh, but eventually the cars did have effect on other uh, modes of transportation. The pedestrian traffic uh, improved uh, largely because improved sidewalks and the cars uh, largely uh, got uh, People were afraid of being in the street with the cars, so they encouraged the town to build more sidewalks. And starting in the early 1900s, they actually uh, had a committee on sidewalks that uh, was responsible for building them and reporting back to town meeting each year on the sidewalks. They, the concrete and gravel, or tar and gravel sidewalks they built. Here we see a report from 1924 saying that they had built the gravel, tar and gravel sidewalk on Main Street between uh, Garrison Road and Pond Street and also on Green Street from Water Street to a property along Green Street. The uh, street railway did thrive, continue to thrive in the early 1900s. Here you see a, a Hingham uh, Square as a transportation hub. You see streetcars and pedestrians and horses and carriages and the train station all in one place. So it was a, a very busy area. And the advantage of the, the streetcar was that uh, you could use it in all seasons and pedestrians uh, around town got relied on more and more on it. It brought the town closer together because you could uh, make it to downtown from Southingham in about 20 minutes and you can attend meetings and social groups and, and that downtown and go back home quite easily. Uh, here we see a couple streetcars passing through uh, the, by, on Main Street passing the, se the second parish church around 1900. And uh, the trolleys were not just Hingham, but they were connected to, interconnected to other town streetcar lines, as you see on this map. So many hub, such as Hingham Center, Sleepy Hingham Center, you saw in that previous photo, uh, can be connected to the wider world. Here you see where the streetcar line in Hingham connects to uh, car lines in Weymouth and to Boston and North, and uh, places to this far to the south. And they started publishing uh, streetcar guides in the 1900s, this from 1905, uh, list that uh, you could get from Boston to Nantasket by streetcar, for instance, or Boston to Brockton. Also little things, how to get you to New Hampshire, and a little sidebar on how you get, could get from New York to Philadelphia by streetcar. Despite that, uh, in the later 1910s, uh, railway patronage began to decline precipitously. And uh, the streetcar company that had been consolidated into Eastern Mass, in this case, they will call the Bay State Street uh, Railway Company. And despite that, with the loss of revenue, they couldn't maintain the tracks well. Here you see an article in the 19, fall 1916 Hingham Journal saying that the, uh, rail, the streetcar line is threatening to close the main street uh, line to Queen Anne's Corner because they don't feel that the track is uh, safe enough to travel on during the wintertime. They said they may or may not uh, be able to restore it by spring. 
and show that what happened was happening in the streetcar line. By 19, the 1920s, actually, the car lines uh, began to be, had to be subsidized by the town to keep running. Um, in this case, in 1921 and 1922, the town passed uh, articles that give the, uh, now the Eastern Mass Electric Street Railway Company $5,000 each year to help maintain the street lines, streetcar lines. Uh, despite that, um, by 1924, the uh, company reported a loss of about $15,000 per year, and the town decided that it was, wasn't sustainable and gave up on subsidizing uh, the streetcar. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you saw a uh, service stopped uh, along the lines in Hingham, Lincoln Street, Downer Avenue in 1916, and along North and Summer to Nantesk in 1921, although there was still a railroad over there until the Depression years and the remaining lines have been closed down in 1926. The steam, as we saw, the steamboat service was now restricted in 1901 to uh, the Crow Point Landing, and it would end up got surviving much pure in 1904. Here you see from the Richardson Collection a steamboat uh, schedule from August 1904, listing only one landing and one pickup from Crow Point. In the summer, in uh, spring of uh, 1904, the uh, the steamboat company approached the town again to repair the docks at uh, Crow Point to keep the steamboat running, but there wasn't enough that they didn't do because in April when they announced the new, April 1905 when they announced the new steamboat season was open, they did list the landing at Crow Point, but when they printed the actual schedule when the steamboat started to run in May, no more stops at Crow Point, and that ended the Hingham the steamboat uh, era. The train, though, kept going, rolling on and on, at least through World War I. Uh, here we see a, a schedule listed in the Hingham Journal in 1914. It showed that there were still 19 runs to Boston at that time. And, but, it, but the train kept uh, starting to lose money, and it showed up in the maintenance and uh, ability to run trains. Uh, the, the reliability, still on reliability of steam trains uh, um, fueled by coal during the World War I era hurt them because a lot of coal shortage happened during the war, and they, they cut back. Uh, on the number of runs per day. Here we see an article in the November 1918 England Journal about losing four more trains due to coal shortages along the line. And well, the reason for all these declines in other transportation industries, well, of course, a lot of cars now uh, did this. This is a little table I did of a number of license plates issued by the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Uh, Massachusetts was the first state to issue license plates starting in 1903. Actually, this is, uh, takes it from 1908 to 1924 in the number, in the number of thousands of plates. And you see there's about 20,000 in 1908, but it goes to 100,000 in 1916, and it goes to 225,000 in 1920, and it goes to 300, and, you know, more than 450,000 in 1924. Needless to say, cars were flooding the roads at that time, and people didn't really have need for these other um, transportation options. And the reason for the cars flooding the market, they were much cheaper. Uh, the, of course, the assembly line that Henry Ford started in 1913 spread to other auto factories and manufacturers started lowering the prices of their cars. And this ad from you know, the Ford dealer in Hingham in 1918, you see that the touring cars started $360 compared to what you saw 800 to 1500 before. You would even get a, a truck for $600. Uh, so a lot more people could buy cars than they were. So this brings us to the transportation businesses that change. Um, one of the highlighted um, people in the Richardson collection is a man that is a, is a man named James E. Kemp, who originally had a, a carriage uh, biz, repair business on South Street in 1895. By 1905, he, he started uh, the first uh, car, uh, auto car repair facility. And in, after the uh, streetcar line didn't need a power station anymore in 1909, they decided to get their power directly from a, a generating plant in Braintree. Um, Mr. Kemp moved his uh, business into the streetcar garage and started the trend of uh, car, cars and uh, car-related uh, businesses along the harbor front on Summer Street. You saw also during this time streetscapes change, more cars, as you see the South Street um, in 1926 in the winter. You see uh, in front of the train station a lot of cars and you don't see any horses in or anything, just cars. The major problem, of course, was the traffic not in town but through town. 
um, initially to, to places like Nantasket Beach. Here's a photo taken in July 4th, early 1920s, of all the cars going to Nantasket on the weekend. Now, where all those cars come through? Hang on, of course. And um, they uh, did a count on one of those days, and um, let me find all of them here. Yeah, okay, so over. Over the count of the 1 July uh, 4th in 1914, about 3,000 cars went through Hingham Square on one Sunday on the way to the Nantasket. So the town you know, started, and people going through town started lobbying the state and saying, we got to do something to approve this. Um, so Hingham decided to lobby for a bill. It would build a bypass around the, the Hingham Square area um, that passed in 1915. Here you see a picture of the newly um, the open boulevard looking towards the Otis Street area in 1923. Um, yeah, 3,200 cars in 1914. Uh, the state uh, started surveying routes in 1915, for, all from the Lincoln Thaxter and Downer Ave intersection all the way uh, to the corner of Hall Street and uh, Rockland Street, uh, West Corner. But by 1918, they, they couldn't decide on the path east of the square, east of uh, Summer Street, so they decided just to build between Lincoln Street and Summer Street uh, by building along widening Bear Cove, uh, uh, the uh, Broad Cove Road area and down uh, on Otis Street and extending Otis to North and Summer Streets. And here we see that how they started demolishing buildings along the harbor front on what the street called Harbor Street, which ran initially along the waterfront in the period in early 1918. And the building, uh, the road building was finished in 1919. And here you see a re uh, photograph from a state report on that construction in 1920 it showed the widening extension of Oda Street looking towards Summer Street. Uh, you can see the house on Cottage Street uh, along the right on the bluff there. So we get to the last period of time, um, 1926 to 1950, uh, car as a rule. And here you see some children interested in a new model car. They probably just, for one of their fathers, just built around 1930. Um, we now see that the existing other happens to the other trillions for racing modes. Um, for the streetcar, like I said, the streetcar service ended in 1926. And over the next few years, the streetcars, uh, the town started paving over the streetcar lines to make it safe for cars. Uh, the street railway service was now provided through buses. Ironically, the Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway Company, the last owner of the uh, trolley cars, uh, began running buses. And here we see a notice in 1946 about them changing its schedule to downtown Hingham. Horses were, of course, put out of the pasture for the most part. Um, you see them on farms. You see them, you know, maybe occasionally on special occasions. Uh, this horse here, seen here, is uh, is uh, leading uh, people in uh, costume actors from Old Chip Church during the tercentennial uh, pageant in 1935. Uh, from there. Train travel started being reused as well. Uh, this picture is from the This Is America book taken by Francis Cook McGregor in 1941. It shows a long line of people getting on the train, but what should be revealed is instead of about 19 trips per day, they were down to less than 10, and so more people had to travel at the same time to get into Boston. And the trains did try to modernize its service to attract more riders in the 1930s. They started using diesel locomotives and more modern designs. This is a, a pass-through by a, street, a new diesel design called the Comet, which didn't run on Hingham Line, but did travel between Boston and Providence, but it was here on a total tour to promote train service in, uh, through Hingham Square in 1935. As you can see, um, the, by 1940, uh, the train was really losing money, and they started threatening to cut back on the number of uh, more, fewer um, track trips into Boston and back. Uh, the citizens started forming groups to lobby, keep lobbying for these uh, unprofitable uh, scheduled trains, and that continued to the war. But in 1946, the uh, New Haven uh, Railroad, the, the, the Gold Colony was now, known, now owned by the New Haven, New York, and Hartford Railway, that declared bankruptcy. And as part of the reorganization uh, agreement with the, with the government, they decided they would continue, uh, continue the train service. Um, south of Boston, but it would be only if they didn't re exceed a certain amount of uh, money of money loss, which happened in uh, 1948. And here you see an article in the Greenham Journal from February of that year, um, later, and this is April of 1848, um, saying that after they decided to cut service in October, the state decided to step in and offer two plans to the people. Uh, one, keep the Treenbush line going will allow them to cut service more, increase fares, 
and allow you to keep your train, and or we can allow the uh, Metropolitan Transit Bus, it's Metropolitan Transit Association, to take over the train tracks and run trains down from further from Boston to Braintree, and you can get on the train there. Well, that's sort of a precursor to the red line that happened later on. But many people in the, in the South Shore area in Higham were not particularly amused by having to travel to Braintree to get on the train. So they lobbied and successfully lobbied to keep the trains running. Although by this time, there's now only one trip in and out per day. And they were heavily advertised in papers. Here you see an advertisement in the 1948 Higham Journal uh, telling you if you can take the train, you can read your paper on the way in. And it's only uh, very convenient. And it's only 80 cents to Boston on, on Sundays. Uh, but in 1949, uh, still not attracting enough uh, riders, they approached the town saying, we will build you a completely new, modern-looking train station to help attract pe more people to the train. Um, we will uh, allow businesses, commercial businesses, in the front of the station to give us money to help subsidize the train service. And uh, all you have to do is approve our, our plan. And so they did. And immediately, almost immediately, in the summer of 18, 1949, they began to tear down the old Hingham Train Depot, this is a picture taken from the corner of Central and North Street around the summer of that year. And a new, new station was built in its place, to a smaller station. Here you see an operation around 19, late 1950 with a bus in front of it. Uh, you may recognize the building is now the home of the Square Cafe and the former home of the Bowling Board. Um, it's still there today, but as the, you know, the particular state, use as a station only lasted until 1954 when it was moved to the newly um, fill in uh, Mill Cove on uh, now Station Street. So bicycles, um, going back to looking at what bicycles were, by the 1920s, they were largely seen as a child's toy, uh, so no longer an effective means of alternative transportation. So you basically saw advertisements for bicycles for children, and usually tricycles were for very, very small children, <laughs> they were for adults. So uh, one of the new things that happened in Hingham in the 1930s was we actually got an airport for a while. Um, here you're looking at a photo of the Bayside Airport. This was uh, established by Peter Bradley of the Bradley Fertilizer Works in 1935. You can see the fertilizer works across the uh, um, back river from the, from the airport. It was his former uh, horse farm and polo grounds he transferred into making a landing strip for airplanes. Um, not only the uh, both land landings, but water landings only. In about 1936 or 37, Hingham had his own, only and first and only airmail uh, trip from the airport. Uh, but I assume, they assumed this one was not very profitable to do it that way. So let's go back to uh, uh, ground delivery. This is from uh, John P. Richards collecting the only photo I could find of the airport in action. Here you see a horse and sleigh yeah. uh, meeting up with a, a plane sometime around 1936 winter time. So, the, but the airport closed in 1938. And so the town was approached, people in town said, well, maybe we should have a municipal airport. So of course they appointed a committee and they studied that in 1939 and reported to the town meeting in 1940 that maybe uh, if the town could buy some land on Scotland Street, uh, sort of the Wampadox, Petty Park area now, uh, it could be turned into an airport. But uh, their, their um, opinions didn't sway much of the town meeting people, so they put it off both in 1940, 1941, and then World War II came and priorities shifted and nothing came out of that. So we're officially in the auto age at this time. Um, a lot of new roads were built uh, in the 1930s and more were proposed. Here we see the, uh, looking at the new, uh, new Justice Cushing Highway, looking towards the harbor and the harbor road arrangements just after that was open, 1933-1934. Uh, the state uh, built uh, the George Washington Boulevard uh, to a hall. It was actually the finishing of the original plan from the 1910s. And they named it after George Washington. It was officially opened in 1932 on the bicentennial of his birth. Uh, some are walk on streets between the harbor and the new boulevard were lined to four lanes to help traffic get there. Um, in, the, in the spring of 1933, the new Justice Cushing Highway was built to take traffic off local roads, and mostly in Cohasset, but Hingham and Situate. And this removed the uh, traffic between harbor and Situate, and it was completed in the spring of 1933. Uh, many people, um, it was completed only a year, which is different from road construction projects at that time. Uh, one of the major issues during that time was the, the, this was a depression, and they hoped, people in Hingham were hoping to get a lot of jobs out of this, but they ended up giving the jobs to a statewide contract, and so people all over the state worked. And uh, people from Hingham didn't think they were paid, who were working there didn't think they were paid as well, so they had to strike. But it still, despite all this, it opened on time. 
and it, the new highway ended at the rotary, as we saw. This is the view looking <coughs> south from the rotary in about 1941, showing how it looked at that time, three boobs at that time. Uh, here's a map. This is one of the earliest maps I could find in 1933, which shows the uh, new uh, highway system. It includes the new uh, Justice Cushing Highway and George Washington Boulevard, and shows the major streets, the main street in town. And it shows in, in some of the streets were marked with root shields, which is another new issue of that time, which will come up later on. So most of the streets, many of the streets, besides the main streets, which is here, were paved. And I guess it's actually looking at Main Street about 1935, uh, traveling north through the Glad Tidings Plain. It's from South Pleasant Street. Uh, this is probably what Main Street sort of looked like when Eleanor Roosevelt went, came to town in 1942 and may, and may, or some people say may not, said it was the most beautiful Main Street in America. Um, the harbor front expanded the streets in the harbor front became home to Auto Central more. Here you see a view from North Street showing the uh, car dealerships, various and its gas stations. Here you see looking the other direction uh, near in front where the uh, mobile station is today. You see across the street a Hudson dealer. You're standing in front of a gas station. You're looking at the down the left towards a Ford dealership. And behind the house on the, on the right there near the end of the view is a, another car dealer on Whitney Wharf. In addition to seeing a lot of car dealerships, you saw a lot more ads in the uh, Hingham Journal for cars. I point these two out because one was a Hudson ad for Hudson cars, which says it's a preview of the future. I know you're happy for all your Hudson cars you have in your garages now. <laughs> and one on the right is a uh, used car dealership was in town, and uh, you don't know how necessarily how used cars got bad reputation, but here we have uh, in Hingham, you could get a used car from a crook. Uh, Carl Crook uh, <laughs> sold uh, used cars. He was the guy, uh, to a safe place to buy used cars at the harbor. And uh, here you see an advert a big one-page advertisement for the new Bomar Motor Sales business on uh, Whitney Wharf. Uh, this is 1946. A few years later, they'd sell out to Wolf Sullivan, Chrysler, and they would be uh, they end up being the last car dealer on, on the harbor when they uh, when the town purchased the uh, location in the 19, late 1980s and tore it down. As I said, there are also many gas stations in town. Now, there are about at least probably a dozen at some time between the Rotary and South Street downtown. And in many other cases, you don't necessarily think of gas stations these days. Here we have one in Hingham Center. This would eventually become Cushing's Garage. This is the Sakami uh, gas station in about 1935, corner of 11th and Main Streets. And here you see a grand opening announcement from 1949 in the journal about a new city service gas station on South Street. And you may know where the building is in the back of the CVS parking lot where this was located. And here you see a Hingham Square traffic in 1949. Um, car, lots of cars in the middle of track, even while you still see the train station being demolished. So you know, one of the other major innovations that Ham got in the 1930s was uh, route numbers officially established. This is the first route numbers that came to town were part of the New England interstate route system established in the 1922s among all the states in, in New England and Eastern New York. Uh, they put uh, route numbers on largely established routes. Route 6 was given to the Cape Way route between Boston and Cape Cod and Plymouth, while 6A was given to the coastal route. And uh, by 1927, though, the U.S. route system was established, and this it put the end of the Lingua route system and uh, changed numbers a bit. And so we have uh, Route 3 uh, along the England route and uh, 3A along the coastal route. And along Main Street, 1929, we had Route 18. And I know you're saying Route 18, that's in Weymouth. Well, it is in Weymouth now, but it was first, it ran from 123 in Rockland to the intersection of East Street and Summer Street in Hingham. And here, it wasn't signed. Uh, many people say, well, maybe it wasn't signed. Well, this is a house a tour booklet, not by the Historical Society, but by another agency supporting the Wilder Memorial Nursery School. In 1930, they have a map, and they show Route 18 along Main Street and East Street. It also shows up in a 1930 map of a town. And the, the, the town thought that uh, the intersection of uh, Route 18 and Route 3A at the corner of East and Summer Street might be developed commercially. So that's why they purchased what that little park now on the island between Kilby, Maine, and Maine and Summer Streets it was the uh, development of that area. So in 1931, Route 18 disappeared and eventually appeared back in Weymouth and to the south of there. And we got Route 128. Which was extent, which was a new circumferential route around Boston, and extended uh, from its first end at uh, Derby and Whiting Streets, along Whiting and then up Main Street, East Street, to and all the way to Nantasket. 
And during this time, both in 1930 and 1931, uh, the state took it to redevelop the, the uh, route of the 128. Um, and it closed parts of the route at times for a couple of months and widened and straightened it. And the town contributed one third of the cost, or 17,000, to do that. And immediately after the route was completed, uh, traffic showed up on Main Street and people started complaining. And the state started to say, well, maybe we'll probably eventually move 228 to a bypass to the east. And they suggested in 1941 that maybe they should build a traffic circle in Hingham Center. Uh, but people there who result in tear down some of the buildings there uh, fought that and the town agreed with them. Here we see a 1931 map showing the construction along 128 and the Main Street. Uh, the red box is saying that it's, it's part of the road is cl was closed from like September to through November of 1931. Uh, here we have an example of what the, some of the rebuilt Route 120 looks like. We have the corner of Short Team of Center, a corner of Short Street and 11th Street. Uh, you see that in front of the Little Play and Canthy uh, store there, there's a, a small 128 marker. And here in 1935, the uh, town took a step to get improved traffic situation by putting up stoplights. Here you see a quite busy Queen Anne's Corner <laughs> for the time in 1935 with the stoplights in installed. Uh, major mix, major changes to the streetscape happened in World War II, mostly in North Hingham, uh, the arrival of the shipyard along Lincoln Street. Here you see a spring 1940 show by the Navy Department showing the near completion of the bridge for 3A over the what would be the train tracks between the two sides of the shipyard on both sides of Lincoln Street. In addition to building that bridge, which during that was construction, they do tour uh, traffic to Beale Street and back on Flotler Road. Uh, they built a new Back River Bridge, uh, a much higher one to allow uh, vessels to get to the ammunition depot uh, on the Back River. And here we see an example of the cars of the time uh, and uh, the administrative building is being built across from the shipyard along uh, Lincoln Street, uh, one of them which would be eventually become North School for the town. And in 1942, um, the state took over a lot of built streets in town uh, between what was the ammunition depot at Bear, now Bear Goat Park and the annex, glass annex at Wampatuck and to uh, improve them for truck traffic. And so they straightened uh, parts of Beale Street, Fort Hill, Duke Ridge, Cross Street High, Free, and Union Streets, and then returned them back to the town. Uh, there were some more continuing widening for cars after the war. We see the proposed widening of uh, South and Main Streets at the corner right down here. Some of you may take advantage of the new wider Main Street in parking for this uh, talk. Um, so Hingham in 1950, the population is about 11,000 people, and mostly people drive, you know, rely on their car to get around. Uh, some there's still some vestiges of the old transportation system. You see the new the new Hingham train station. Uh, and the open train uh, crossing by St. Paul's, uh, surrounded by cars parked in the street. And so uh, we saw the, over, this saw the American move towards the highway, which, uh, and, the, and the car being dominant. And this happened until probably the early 1960s, and since then we've seen sort of a retreat and a sort of a, a return to more options of transportation, perhaps coming circle in the next seven, more than 70 years. It started out with the end of the railroad in 1959, uh, but by the mid-60s, after Route 128 became Route 228, the state uh, wanted to build an expressway, and the town decided to reject that. Uh, Boston people rejected the highways through their town, and, and more effort was put on public transportation. The boats returned in 1975 uh, at Hewitt's Cove, and the train returned in 2007. And a few years ago, the town actually established an official bike route to small certain forms of transportation in town. So that's where you got from here to, the, to the, here to the, there to here. <laughs> okay, so I'm, that's, thank you. That's any questions you may have? Thank you. I, do you know, it was, I think it said 1968, the town rejected um, an express, 228 expressway. Mm -hmm. Was that the one that was proposed to go through Wampatuck. what is now Wampatuck? Yes. Mm -hmm. And why did they reject it, do you know? Well, um, you know, a lot of the traffic, like it caused the disruption. Um, it, it, 
in the early 60s, when it was first proposed, many of the town officials approved of the plan and the sort of uh, pushed it forward. Um, but it sort of, the support for roads and road construction started waning in, in the late 60s and you know, people were, you know, saw the disruption and this is sort of the, you know, era started the you know, preservation and people saw a lot of it. It would have run down near where the, Cur where the Cushing Farm is now along East Street. Um, it would, would have run along um, crossing uh, the you know, uh, Weir River down by you know, across near the harbor in that area. So it would have been very disruptive to those uh, areas of town. But now when you see Main Street, <laughs> you think there should have been some kind of a solution like that might have saved yeah. all that traffic. Yeah, well, it comes back from time to time. <laughs> yeah. But now that we have the state park there, it's probably almost impossible to get some, some road through there now. So. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we move away from cars and we'll have less traffic and stuff, so. More questions? Bob, great talk. Your uh, attention to detail and your grasp of the facts and the timelines and everything are just superb. I'm wondering if you could comment, if you know any detail in terms of the demographics in Hingham and those people that were commuting into Boston for jobs. Um, it seemed like the ferries were originally, they were taking some passengers in, but freight seemed to be a major component of that. Um, and I'm just wondering at what point did it seem that perhaps many residents of Hingham were working, say, in Boston and, and needed to get into Boston um, for jobs as opposed to simply commerce uh, related uh, activities? Yeah, well, you, you don't see a lot of commuters into town until it really the town became more of a, you know, a suburb sort of style itself as a streetcar suburb of Boston, sort of the early 1900s. Like I said, around 1860, like I said, around 1865 or so, about there, about 45 people identified as commuters going into work in Boston. This increased to like about 80 in about 1875 and about 130 or 40 by 1885, 1890. So there wasn't, a, and the population of Hingham at that time was about four, you know, 5,000, 6,000 people. So there wasn't a, really a whole lot up to that time of people who had offices in Boston and, and worked there. You did see a lot of people who, you know, lived down here during the summer and moved back into Boston during the winter time. And maybe some of those people used the steamships during when you're here in the summer. But you see, it saw a lot more increase in use of the railroad um, as, as, as a, a frequent uh, um, better use of, the, of, of their um, transportation. Uh, the original the Boston, the steamers really in Boston went in um, sort of where the Long Wharf is, a sort of north end area is now. Um, but, at, and then, but after the, uh, the Boston fire of 1872 or so, parts of that area were burned down and they moved it towards where the Rose Wharf area, closer to the financial type area of town. And so then that might have helped a little at the time for more people taking the boat, but I still think that most people, since the steamboat only arrived in the summertime, and it was more catered to the, you know, the tourist trade, trade than the, the working people, um, for a little more expensive probably and stuff than the train. So you saw more people using the train as it, time went on. Yes, when I was working at the uh, Old Ordinary, taking fifth grade classes through, we were told that there were two boats at one time, uh, one for the Whigs and one for the Tories, because they wouldn't ride together. <laughs> and yeah. I thought it was a very appropriate thing for today's mm -hmm. problems that yeah, we're having. Yeah, yeah, Is not. that true? Ah, uh, yes, for the packet boats prior to the steamboat era in early 1800, yes, there was uh, boats that catered to the, you know, the Federalist side and more to, and the other to the yeah. Jeffersonian side. And so, yes, they were, uh, and you wouldn't, if you were one, if you were belonging to one group, you wouldn't dare be seen on the boat with the other group, even if that was the only boat that was leaving and you had to stay in town in Boston or find other transportation to get home, you wouldn't get on the other boat, <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> more questions? Well, I just wanted to thank our, not just speaker, but Bob has put so much effort into telling this comprehensive story of transportation. So this is a small token of our appreciation on behalf of the Education Committee. Thank you. Thank you.